Thank you, Lord Provost. The second and subsidiary toast uh, of our dinners has always been to an organization of which Scott was a member or with which he was personally associated. And that is true tonight, very much so in the sense that the toast is to the university. Um, I myself now am an honorary fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities, appointed last year by the late Susan Manning. Many of you knew this lady, as, as I did, her death in the Royal Infirmary just two, two months ago, leaving a void in the lives of all who knew her, and leaving a gap in the Republic of Letters which it would not be easy to fill. In November 1783, Walter Scott entered the university studying Latin and Greek for two years, which was required uh, if he wished uh, to graduate. He did very badly in Greek, he tells us in his autobiography. I was known, he says, as the Greek blockhead. And in his second year, he switched to logic and metaphysics under Professor John Bruce, in which he did well, and was required to, e to read a an essay on behalf of his entire class before William Robertson, the distinguished historian and principal of the university. However, he became ill during that uh, time at, uh, at the college and withdrew early in 1786. In 1789, he returned, and this second period at college, unlike the first, was crucial to his intellectual development. He studied moral philosophy under Professor Dougald Stewart, whose, great, uh, whose, whose, whose memory uh, is enshrined upon our Carlton Hill in that monument next to that of Burns, the Lysergic monument of, of the Zicrates, modeled on the one in Athens, which adorns the southern slopes of the Carlton Hill. Dougal Stewart was an outstanding teacher, and Scott speaks very strongly of him and the quality of his teaching and philosophy. Scott absorbed Stewart's version of the philosophy of common sense, and he ran also a literary salon to uh, Stewart, at which Scott was a frequent visitor, both as a student and then as a young advocate. In that time, he also studied universal history under Alexander Fraser Tytler, a great friend and advisor of Robert Burns. And in 1790 to 91, in that academic year, Scott took civil law, which he did not enjoy, but passed the examination set by the Faculty of Advocates, of which he was later to be a member. He also studied Scott's law, which he continued in the following session, 1791 to his professor of Scott's law being the namesake and the nephew of David Hume, perhaps the greatest star of our enlightenment. A great pleasure, therefore, to invite all present to charge your glasses once more and drink with me a toast to our college, to the University of Edinburgh. The University. The University. The University. The University. To reply, a great pleasure to call on a colleague. Professor Greg Walker is the Regius Professor of Rhetoric and English Literature at the University, having previously been our Masson Professor of English here at Edinburgh. Before that, he was Professor of Early Modern Literature and Culture and Director of the Medieval Research Centre at the University of, of, um, of, of Leicester. He gained a BA in History and his PhD in early Tudor uh, history from the University of Southampton and was a British Academy postdoc fellow at Southampton, plus then a spell of teaching in Australia, Queensland. Greg has published widely on late medieval drama and poetry, Renaissance literature, and the early history of the stage. He is currently principal investigator on the AHRC funded project Staging and Representing the Scottish Renaissance Court. And in collaboration with Historic Scotland and theatre professionals, he and his colleagues will stage productions of Sir David Lindsay's A Satire of the Three Estates at the Lithgow Palace and Stirling Castle in June of this year. Unmissable. A fellow of the Royal History Society, Historical Society and the Society of Antiquaries, Greg chairs the judges for the James Tate Memorial Prize at the University and is a member of the editorial board of Medieval English Theatre Literature Compass and Research in Medieval Drama. To respond to the toast, University of Edinburgh, Greg Walker. Mr. Chairman, Lord Provost, Your Grace, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I hope that covers everyone. 
Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very helpful introduction, very kind introduction, and for the toast. I'm honoured to have been asked to respond to that gracious toast to the university delivered so eloquently tonight by our chair. I think what makes it particularly satisfying to do that is that I do so as the university's 17th Regis Professor of Rhetoric and English Literature at a point when we move from celebrating the first 250 years of English and Scottish literature at the university to beginning to plan for the next 250 years of literature. Uh, that's 250 years measured from the appointment of the celebrated Hugh Blair, of course, as the first Regis Chair in 1762. Some of you may have seen the uh, some excellent small exhibition at the University Library. I look for a show of hands. <coughs> Maybe one or two. Anyway, I think if you haven't seen it, there are still some t-shirts in the University Exhibition Centre for a very reasonable price. Uh, what I think you can be confident of, uh, on a more serious note, is that Sir Walter and his writings will surely feature as prominently in the curriculum in the next two centuries as they have in the last two and a half. In Scott's day, of course, the chair I hold was named for rhetoric and belles lettres, uh, a much more interesting and mellifluous title, I think, and I'm disappointed that I can't use that myself. Sadly, it didn't commend itself to the rather sober later Victorian university authorities who, perhaps thinking it smacked too much of the French salon, the chaise long, and absinthe for the age of industry, renamed it in its rather more functional modern form. So rhetoric in English literature, I am although probably not, as you'll realise in the course of this short speech, in that order. But I am, however, buoyed by Sir Walter's own advice to those of us in these uh, situations on occasions like this. You will find people satisfied with wonderfully indifferent jokes, if you can hit the taste of the company, which depends much on its character. Like a managing indifferent jokes, you can, you can do the character, I hope. As you'll have detected from my accent, I didn't have the good fortune to be born in Scotland or to experience Edinburgh as a student. Um, I was born and bred in the East Midlands in England and so have come here late. Excuse me, I also got a cold with me. So I'll move away from the microphone, this could be distressing. <laughs> but those of you with good hearing at least. But I think the advantage of coming late to Edinburgh is that I can appreciate the virtues and the pleasures of the city and of the university all the more appreciatively. Not, I hope, perhaps quite in the manner that Scott describes in his accounts of his own student days of too much idleness and too much conviviality, alluding to what Lockhart termed the juvenile bacchanalia that were indulged among the young men of Edinburgh, by what women were doing, I'm not sure, to an extent now happily unknown. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure um, that the young men and women of modern Edinburgh are quite so ignorant of what Shakespeare termed the tipsy bacchanals as Lockhart believed, but I can certainly attest that the conviviality of the community of scholars at the university has been among the greatest pleasures of my time here so far. Would perhaps that the university administration give us more time for idleness as well than I could catch up with the Waverley novels, all of which I now have on my Kindle as well. So it's, uh, it's clearly a popular edition that month. As I told the chair when he kindly invited me to attend this, uh, this, this gathering and respond, I'm not a Scot scholar. My own field is the 16th century, so I speak as one for whom Sir Walter is a very modern writer rather than a very old one. And if I might uh, take your uh, indulgence for a moment to briefly put in a plea for a greater appreciation of the glories of the 16th century in Scotland, an era often perhaps understandably overshadowed by the later struggles of the Reformation, the Union of the Crowns, and the obvious glories of the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Yet for a short period, at least, I think, in the reigns of King James IV and V, Scotland was at the centre of a European artistic renaissance, which was until the career of Shakespeare down south, at least, the cultural jewel of these islands. Writers such as Dunbar, Henderson, Douglas, Sir Walter's own professed favourite, the classicist Buchanan, who I'm told I have to pronounce Buchanan, but that may be a northern thing, readily mixed continental humanist sophistication with vibrant local colour and human detail. Uh, you might think of Dunbar's bawdy reflections on the personalities and events of his own age in poems such as The Trois Married Women and the Widow, which I remember in the 1970s in his seminar mishearing as The Two Married Women and the Weirdo, which is a much more interesting potential book than what we got to read. And his memorable address to the merchants of Edinburgh regarding the shocking state of the tomb. 
main Anne passed through your principal gates for speak of haddocks and of skates, for cries of carlings and debates, for fensome flightings and defame. Think ye no shame? It's all a bit better now, I think. On the whole. <laughs> all these are, are great and remarkable literary achievements. And as we've just heard very kindly from the chair, Sir David Lindsay's satire of the three estates, I think, tops them all. I think I've put in a plea for uh, Lindsay in that triumvirate, or however many there are, of great writers from Scotland who are the match of anyone anywhere else in the world. Uh, and as we've heard, we're putting on research-driven, as it's called, production at Linlithgow Palace with a professional cast of Scottish actors and Gregory Thompson from La Trombe as director in June. Five and a half hours. It's never been done in its full length before. If you think you've seen the satire of the three estates before, you've seen the, uh, the, those of you of a certain age will call the 45 single version. We're doing the album. It's five and a half hours long. Bring a chair. <laughs> but please do come. But, I hear you cry, we're here to discuss Sir Walter Knox Sir David, and specifically his relationship with the university. And here I think we do hit something of a stumbling block if we accept the conventional view. Arthur Melville Clark, Reader Emeritus of the University and former president of this club, concluded his study of Scott's formative years on a rather sombre note. If the University of Edinburgh owes some of its glory to having had Scott as an alumnus, he wrote, you can see there's a but coming, it must be admitted that Scott owed little of his achievement to the university. He learned none of his mighty magic within its walls, and in all the essentials of his art, he was self-educated. But, uh, in our defence, he does go on to concede that it's not only in its formal curriculum that the university consists, but also in the wider network of informal links and associations, the friendships built up with staff and fellow students, the membership of clubs and societies that grow up around a thriving university. And still more, perhaps, in the habits of reading, of conversation and debate that universities generate and nurture in the young men and young women who attend them, and sometimes a lot of young men and women who attend them, that the full effects of their education are to be measured. And in this wider sense, I think, the university can take some satisfaction, at least, in its uh, influence on Sir Walter, as well as on his influence upon it. As we've heard, Scott's two periods as a student Severely disrupted by illness, though they were, saw him throw himself into the life of the city and of the university's intellectual communities with great passion. He may have been more engaged with the speculative and literary societies than with his classes in Greek, that we've heard, but the essays he wrote for the spec were, in Professor Dougal Stewart's view at least, impressive. As Melville Clark observes, Sir Walter was an inveterate autodidact. He supplemented his formal studies and his apprentice years in the law with voracious reading in many languages, and perhaps of equal importance in voracious listening and collecting of the tales and songs and ballads he heard on his travels in the borders and elsewhere. I think I instinctively sympathise with his accounts of his delight in immersing himself in a medieval romance or a heroic ballad. And who but the driest of lawyers, and I'm sure there are no dry lawyers present tonight, could not share the sentiments of the delightful poem to Jesse beginning, Away with parchments, warrants, bills, come fairies, brownies, knights and giants, avaunt all stupid books of law, Shakespeare and Spencer are my clients. But his monumental literary canon, I think, attests to a mind more than well furnished and a capacity to engage deeply with the burning subjects of his own day, as we've heard. The law, finance, religion, and politics, and consummately with the rich history of region and nation and the history of European <coughs> literature. So his accounts of himself as an incorrigibly idle imp at his books must be taken with a lot of poetic license. I'm not sure that all modern students share his passion for extracurricular reading, but I'm pleased to say that many do. And many also attend the theatre, poetry readings, and the cinema with as avid a passion. So I suspect that the argument sometimes encountered in the Racia newspapers that today's student is a dumbed down, spoon fed creature, unlike the heroic, independent intellect of a former age, doesn't stand up to close scrutiny, not, at least not in Edinburgh. Albeit, I suspect that the kinds of ballads that my students at least collect on their mobile phones might be a little bit more alarming to Sir Walter if he were able to hear them. Indeed, in conclusion, if he were to consider the modern university, what might he have think? What might he think? 
Although he would certainly, well probably, look askance at what's happened to George Square since he lived there. Even given the newly refurbished library with its coffee bars and student learning pods. I've no idea what they are either. I hope that he would have recognised some of the features of the university. Its social and its intellectual life, still intact from his own days. He might note, I hope with some degree of pleasure, that a number of the newer buildings in and around the square bear some familiar names. The tower named after David Hume, the namesake uncle of one of his lecturers. Another building named for Dougald Stewart, and a third for Adam Ferguson, whose son of the same name was a classmate. And the university principal but before whom he read that essay, William Robertson, is the dedicatee of another building. Indeed, at one point he was the dedicatee of two buildings, as a new William Robertson history build wing appeared in the old medical block, while the old William Robertson building stayed in George Square. Imagine the problem the postman had with that one. So Walter, I think, might note with pride that the spec continues to thrive and indeed approaches its own 250th anniversary, and observe, perhaps with a more mixed emotion, that the Edinburgh Review goes from strength to strength under the editorship of my colleague, the poet Alan Gillis, acting as a forum once again for bold new writing in Scotland <coughs> and across the world. A new literary society flourishes in the English department, and young writers can now hone their craft in very popular courses in creative writing. The project to edit and publish the Letters of Scott's contemporary, Thomas Carlyle, led by my colleagues Ian Campbell, Aileen Christensen and Jonathan Wilde, is nearing completion after over 40 years of scholarly labour. And still more pertinently, perhaps, the Edinburgh edition of the Waverley novels, published by EUP, was completed in 30 volumes, as you well know, at the end of last year, after more than 25 years of work, by, among others, David Dykes, Archie Turnbull, both former presidents of the club, I believe, and Peter Garside of this parish, Emeritus Professor of Bibliography and current Secretary of the Club, who edited six of the volumes. As in Scott's day, about when about half the student body studied in the Faculty of Arts, the arts continue to lead the university in teaching and in research. Indeed, if you're in George Square at any time in the, in the near future, have a look around. There's a banner which proudly and rather oddly uh, declares the University of Edinburgh 11th best in the world for arts and humanities. <laughs> uh, I do wonder what Sir Walter would have thought of that. Um, Scott never, as far as I know, had the pleasure of hearing Hugh Blair lecture, and so neither did Blair have the pleasure of teaching Sir Walter. But I hope that both of them would look on the current university with a degree at least of satisfaction and join me in thanking you for your generous and much appreciated toast to its continued success. Thank you very much. to Professor Walker for that uh, splendid response to the toast to the university. And you're absolutely right, Scott was committed to higher education. And of course, we do recall in this time that he and uh, Lord Coburn and others were the moving spirits behind the, the conception and then the actuality of Edinburgh Academy for excellence in teaching in Latin and Greek and, and literature, thereby preparing the youngsters of the time for not only our own university, but also for, for Oxford and Cambridge. Thank you very much indeed, Greg. We're coming to the end of the formal part of the proceedings, and it now simply gives me enormous pleasure uh, to invite um, Dr. Margaret Bennett uh, to come up, if she will, and give us a vote of thanks. Margaret. Yeah. It's a testimony to the conviviality and enjoyment of the evening that Nothing, not even the thought of having to speak at the end, could spoil my enjoyment. I hope not yours. I told you it's now, of course. And when I accepted the honour of according a vote of thanks, I knew that I might run out of epithets before long, so I'm going to keep it simple. There are lots of people to thank here for making this night as special as it's been. To the Reverend Alan McLean, Yes. Saying the great there, there, there. Who, who moved away mm -hmm. for saying the grace. Um, I must say that I do like to hear um, the Lord praise for the arts. It makes a change from harmony and tea and toast, praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. <laughs> um, 
to our inimitable president, David Pardy. Sure. Our inimitable chair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nerves show through all, all together. Um, to our speaker, the president, Sir Max Hastings. I have never heard him speak in public except perhaps through the media. And um, I found myself sitting beside the journalist and that was rather a nice dialogue that took place without either of you knowing it. To our Lord Provost, the Right Honour of Donald Wilson. To our Professor, Greg Walker. I heard more about my alma mater than I knew. Thank you. And of course, we've all enjoyed the meal to Colin Campbell and the staff at the new club. Yeah. Yeah. We should call them very well. <laughs> not quite last, and definitely not least, Lee Simpson. Oh, <laughs> He's an expert, he does that for a living in some senses of the world, and he, in fact, I think should be doing this vote of thanks, used to speaking in public as you are, are you? Mm -hmm. And for the menu cards, the seating arrangements, in fact, all of the organization, and in fact, even for finding out that Sir Max had by his bedside a copy of the antiquity. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have known? Well, thanks for that. And um, I think he deserves a very special vote of thanks. Yeah. And on a personal note, I would also like to thank Fraser Elgin. I imagine he's probably one of our longest members of the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Society. And on my personal thanks would be to Fraser for introducing me to the club some 30 years ago. And I think all of us perhaps could be grateful to him for finding Lee Simpson. <laughs> for without that sort of very happy <coughs> association, we would actually be quite bereft. It's been a rather marvelous association. <laughs> Though Sir Max began with comparison between <coughs> Sir Walter Scott and his elder brother in the news, I would have to confess that as closely as I listened, I couldn't but think of that elder brother in the news and his words. Let friendship and honour unite and flourish on both sides of tweed. And I think that um, it perhaps resonates with rather than um, compares <coughs> to Scott's <coughs> expression of that. What you have earlier described as an evening of pure delight. I think none of us would have disagreed with that. So I would like you to join me in according a very, very warm and sincere thank you to all who have made that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That concludes the formal part of the evening, but not the evening itself. Sociability, as Walter Scott would require, will now continue for as long as you care to remain. <laughs> Do have a safe journey home, and we look forward to seeing you all at the meetings of the club in the coming year. Thank you all very much indeed.